we are, I'm incredibly excited to have uh, Leah Vero here. Uh, if you haven't heard her name, I can pretty much guarantee you, you've used her work. Uh, she has done amazing work in uh, user experience and, and web standards. She's written the book on CSS secrets, um, and she's authored more tools than I can care to count, tools that I use all the time that I did not know she wrote. Um, so she uh, has an enormous amount of experience. She's currently a research assistant or researcher at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and uh, she's joined us at this conference, and we're excited to hear from her. So let's give a warm welcome to Leah Vero. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so hi there, I'm Leah. Uh, here's a little known fact, fact about me. I'm from Greece, and specifically from the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian. Not many people know that. So I like making stuff. Um, you might have used some of my work. Uh, here is a few of them, like Prism, Prefix Free are the most popular ones. You can find the rest on my GitHub. I'm in the CSS working group, which just means that I'm trained to spend increasing amounts of time discussing issues of decreasing importance about CSS. Uh, and as my day job, I do research at MIT uh, about human computer interaction. Specifically, how to make it easier for people to make web applications. And I've written a book, so if you like this talk, you should look it up. It's awesome, you should buy it. So, uh, enough about me. Let's move on to something more interesting, such as pie charts. Pie charts are everywhere. They're on XKCD, on old windows, on walls, on genitals, on food, <laughs> on blackboards. And I don't need to tell you that pie charts are everywhere on the web. You, you know it. They're, uh, we see pie charts to show statistics. We see pie charts as pro progress indicators. These are becoming especially popular lately. Uh, iOS on, on iPhones is using them all the time. But yet, how do we make pie charts with web technologies? Even the simplest of pie charts, just two colors, one showing one percentage, is surprisingly difficult to make with web technologies. And we end up using like bloated frameworks even for this kind of simple thing. So I want you to think about this for a moment. How would you make a super simple pie chart like this with CSS? Or any, uh, any or SVG, really. Think about it for a moment. When I, had to, when I um, wondered about this, my first thought was, OK, we need custom angles. Um, I will use a skewed pseudo element. So I did something like this. Um, we have an element. We give it a border radius of 50%. We make it round. Then we add a pseudo element to it, an empty pseudo element with a background of gold, which is our, what we want for the segment color. We give it a padding of 50% to make it square. Let's position it. And 50% from the left, 50% from the bottom. And let's hide this extra thing. So overflow hidden, and now we can start applying a skew transform. So it's st sort of starting to look like a pie chart, but not quite. Pie charts don't really work like this. What are we missing? We're missing a transform origin. So bottom left, and now that the skewing is applied from the bottom left corner, so we have a pie chart, a basic pie chart, that sort of works, sort of. <laughs> uh, no, 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 wait a moment, because this is not a very good idea, and you'll see why. So it starts breaking, and then we can show a few more percentages until it breaks again. We can patch that too, and then, but it will always break at, ni at, at 90 degrees, which we need to show uh, the 50% the percentage. But we can sort of special case that, and we can special case percentages over 50 by having an over half class, and overriding a few declarations for those percentages. So we can sort of make a pie chart component like this. But, and we can say there, I solved it. I, I made a pie chart with pure CSS. But is, is that a good idea? Do you really feel good making something like this? Because I feel like I need to wash my hands after coding something like that. Um, just doing something with CSS doesn't mean it's a good idea. Yes, CSS can give us really good solutions. 
uh, sometimes better solutions than JavaScript because it's reactive, so we don't have to worry about applying state and unapplying state, which is what we need to do with JavaScript. But just doing something with, with pure CSS doesn't make it a good idea. A lot of the time, it's, it's a very hacky solution that doesn't really make sense. For a solution to be good, it needs to be flexible, it needs to be maintainable, it needs to be extensible. And you might define these terms differently, and that's fine. Uh, what I'm referring to by flexibility is, for example, things like, is it possible to change things? Uh, in a pie chart, you, I, there are certain things that are very likely to be changed, like the size, the colors, the percentage, obviously. Um, but it's, being able to change things is not enough. Uh, can I change them inline? If I make a pie chart component, then I need to, uh, and, and I want to set different percentages via JavaScript, I need to be able to change that inline at least until CSS variables are more widely supported, uh, then it won't matter. So I can't have code that needs to be modified in a pseudo element because I can't, I can't set that in line. And also, it's not, just, it's, it's not even enough to be able to change things in line. In how many places do I have to make edits to change these things? In software engineering, this is called dry, don't repeat yourself. The opposite is wet. We, uh, we enjoy typing, don't do that. Uh, so. Dry code means that you have uh, to change one aspect of it, you have to make only one edit, ideally. Two is sort of passable. More is just, it's, it's a maintenance nightmare because in, down the line, you're bound to forget a few of those places and uh, you'll break, uh, you'll, you'll break thing and you won't know what happened. So try to, tr try to make code that can be changed in as few places as possible. Maintainable basically means how much will the next programmer want to kill you? Uh, and there are a few, some heuristics about that, but they're all heuristics. It's, it's more of a gut feeling. For example, how much code there is. The more code there is, the more they have to process. Even if it's good code, it's the more they have to process. But again, it's a heuristic. Uh, a lot of code that's understandable is obviously much better than one line of hacky code that nobody understands. Uh, also in a CSS uh, and HTML solution, do, are you using extra elements? Then they will need to modify two places so it kind of increases the complexity. But most importantly, how straightforward is it? How hacky does it feel to you? Does it make sense? Uh, and we'll see what I mean throughout this talk. Extensible, by extensible, I mean how is easy it is to, ex to extend it to do more things in the future. For example, in the pie charts, can I have multiple segments? That's an obvious extension. I'm showing one percentage. T tomorrow, I might need to show two percentages. Can I animate it? That's also very likely to want to do, even to animate the slices as they come in, or to have a progress indicator that looks like a pie chart and just spins around. Or can I have effects? Can I apply gradients, patterns, that type of thing? Uh, for different problems, obviously, you can define these differently. So in this case, we have quite a bunch of code. It doesn't really make much sense. How do I display 10%? How do I display 10%? It's actually minus 54 degrees. That made sense. Uh, I, I have to change the colors in two places. In general, I, I don't need to tell you why it's actually pretty bad code. So yeah, it's not very flexible. I need to make four edits to change the percentage. Four edits, in, if, if you count uh, increasing it from uh, something that's under 50% to something over 50%, for example. Uh, I can't set the value in line because I, I, it's set on the pseudo element. It's, yeah, uh, it's not very maintainable also, very hacky. Uh, it's not, it's, it sort of could be hacked to do, uh, to be extended, but eh, it's, it's, not very, it's not very good. So overall, this, this solution is a pile of crap. Can we do better? So my next idea was, a rotated pseudo element. I want to show uh, multiple percentages at uh, different angles. Hmm, let's use rotations. So my idea was uh, I would color the circle with, I would give the uh, one side of the circle uh, the pink color, the other side the gold color, and then I would have a pseudo element that rotates and progressively uncovers it. So you'll see what I mean in a bit. First, let's color uh, one part of the circle pink, and the other part of the circle gold by using a CSS gradient. And let's add a pseudo element. Of course, the pseudo element would need to be pink because 
remember it's covering our circle. So, and it covers half of it. Now let's make it a semicircle. We can do that in two ways. We can either apply overflow hidden to the parent, or we can do it with border radius. Border radius does way more things than just rounding, um, just uniform rounding. So we can use the extended border radius syntax, uh, which lets us specify different, um, different radii per corner. So it's zero on the top left corner, 100% on the top right, 100% on the bottom right, then zero and 50% vertically. So now we do have a semicircle, and we can start rotating it around. So it sort of looks like where we, what we were going for, but not quite. Why? Because we're missing transform origin again, which should be left center, so just left. So now we can show all percentages from 0 to 50%, no words, no having to patch paddings or anything. Of course, it breaks after 50% due to how it works. But I can also special case percentages over half by using an over half class. And in this case, it's fewer things that I have to override. I just have to apply the other color on the pseudo element. And instantly, I can show all percentages uh, after 50%. So this already works kind of much better. There are a few improvements I can make. Um, as you can see, I, to change the colors, I would need to override the gradient. Mm, that's not a very good idea. And I have the colors in two places. The F06 is here and here. The gold background is here and here. Can I eliminate this duplication? This is what I'm talking about when I say dry code. Don't have the same bit of information in multiple places if you can avoid it. So actually, in this case, I can avoid it, at, uh, at least for the pink. So I will use transparent and specify the pink as a background color. And then I can inherit it here. So why did this not work? Because I'm inheriting the, the, the entire background, not just the color. So it's inheriting the two colored uh, gradient. But what about gold? I can't use transparent here. So what can I do to eliminate this duplication? Here, I have gold in two places, here and here. That's not good. How many of you have heard about current color in CSS? Three of you? OK, good. Um, there's a new thing to learn. So current color is basically the first CSS variable. And it's supported pretty uniformly across browsers. So current color always refers to the value of the, color, uh, of the color property. So now, if I change the color property, say 0CA or something, it changes everywhere I've used current color, it updates to 0CA. So it's basically the first variable in CSS. And I can also make the degrees a little bit more straightforward by using turn units. So this is 10%, percent point 0.1 is, turns is 10%, percent, point 0.2 turns is 20%, percent, and so on. So it's much more straightforward to convert uh, our percentages to parameters for the rotation. So can I animate it? I can basically code this entire thing that I'm doing manually, this increasing the rotation thing. Oops. Uh, yeah. All right. So I'm increasing the rotation manually here. I can do that. I can code that in the animation. And I can code the, the, the changing colors halfway through in the animation as well. So it's not very straightforward to animate it, but it's possible. So I will need two animations, one for the color and one for the rotation. The rotation one is easy. It's just transform from 0 to 0.5 turns. And I would need to remove this here. The color, though, that's a little bit less straightforward. So I need to, sp I, I, I need to make the change in at 50% and change the background color to inherit. And then set current color here. And by default, 
If I apply such an animation, the color would smoothly change, right? Say one second infinite. As you can see, it smoothly changes. I don't want that. So what can I do? I can use step start as a timing function. And that, doesn't, that, that cancels every, any interpolation. The color just flips halfway through, which is basically what we wanted here. And then for the, for the spinning one, things are much easier. Although, because the, uh, um, the duration of the spinning animation does need to be half, and it needs to be linear, otherwise it will accelerate. And let's make that infinite too. So, as you can see, we can animate it. But we didn't really want an animated pie chart here. We, we just wanted a static pie chart that shows us different percentages. Can we, can we take advantage of the animation to, do, to, 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 to make a pie chart where we change the percentage only in one place without any over half classes or anything? I mean, the browser clearly knows all the stages, all the, uh, all the intermediate states. We just wanted to stop the animation and, so that we can sort of go through it. And this is where what I called static interpolation comes in. Let's look at this simpler case, uh, this much simpler animation. So let's, know, let's call our animation foo. Uh, and it's a very simple one that changes the background color from gold to F06. You'll see F06 a lot. It's my favorite color. And let's write an animation, make it linear. And let's link foo to it. So as you can see, the browser, oh, an infinite, so that it repeats. So the browser, as you can see, knows all the intermediate colors between gold and F06. So why is it that we cannot specify that we want a color that's halfway through gold and F06 statically without using an animation? Since, I mean, the browser knows all this logic. The, the browser knows how to interpolate. We, and we just want this one color that's halfway between, the, between them. What we can do is we can use animation play state, paused, to stop the animation. And then there's this thing called animation delay, which is designed to delay the animation. So by default, it's zero seconds. If you, if you set it to one second, obviously it delays the animation by one second, nothing interesting here. However, what not many people know is that you can set it to negative numbers as well. And then the animation starts halfway through, depending on what animation delay you set. Here it would, it would start at 10%, here it would start at 40%. So combined, if, if we combine that with animation play state paused, then we can basically step through the animation statically. So let's do that here. We have an animation delay of, say, let's make this 100, just so we have nicer numbers. So minus 10 second gives us a color that's 10% uh, um, temp bet between gold and F06. 50 would give us the color that's halfway through, and so on. Except when we get to 100. Then it goes back to gold, which is our starting color. But we wanted to get F06, which is our ending color. So the reason is that this animation, I mean, we're still stepping through the same animation. It's just stopped. It's just paused, but we're still stepping through. And at, uh, at the 100 second mark, it just starts again. So we have to stop the infinite, okay, cancel the infinite, and then give it an animation fill mode of forwards, which basically means the last frame, keep it there. Don't change it, don't snap back. Just keep the last frame there. And now, as you can see, minus 100 seconds gives us F06, which is what we wanted. So let's try now to step through this more complex animation and do the same thing. So first we need to cancel infinite and specify forwards. And let's make this 100 so we have nicer numbers because that correspond to our percentages better. And animation play state paused to stop it. And then animation delay. 
oh, and we also need to make this to give this two iterations because now it's not infinite and it's half the duration. So now animation delay of 10 seconds. Let's reapply it just in case. Yep. So an animation delay of, 10, of minus 10 seconds gives us 10%. And we can show all percentages just by changing this one number. So now I, I essentially took an example where I had to change multiple things to, make, uh, to show different percentages. And I made it into an example where I can only change this one parameter to show all the different percentages. But you might, be say, you might be thinking, wait a second, Leah. This animation delay is still in a pseudo element. I can't set, the inli I, I can't set it via inline styles. Didn't you say that, it, that things should be possible to change inline? Well, yes. But here's the trick. Yes, animation delay is on the, on the pseudo element, but there's no animation here. There's no animation on our main element. So if I specify animation delay on our main element, it does absolutely nothing. So it doesn't interfere with anything, and then I can just use inherit here. So this way, I can change animation delay on the, on the main element, and it modifies it on the pseudo element. And that I can set by an inline style. So overall, this is much more flexible. Sort of, it's still, it, it's, it's still too much code for what it does, really. But it's somewhat less hacky. It's somewhat more maintainable. Uh, I, I can't really do multiple values because of how, because of how it um, progressively uncovers half of the circle and the way it works. And obviously, I can't do any effects either for the same reason. So overall, it's better, not great, though. Can I do better? So many of you must have thought of SVG when I asked about pie charts. However, the common solution is something like this very little CSS, and a, and a path with cryptic numbers that almost nobody understands. When I gave a similar talk at, other, uh, at another conference, I asked, does anybody understand what these parameters mean? And the only person that raised their hand was Chris Lilly, who created the SVG. So, <laughs> so there's that. And the other problem with this is that, do you see this 40, 80 there? That's the coordinates of this point here. So obviously, it's not very straightforward to set, to change the, the, the numbers here and change the percentage. Like, what, what does a 10%, what numbers, do, the, the, what coordinates do, does 10% correspond to? I don't know. I would need to do trigonometry to figure it out. Nobody wants to do trigonometry when they're writing CSS. It's, so that's, that's why most people would probably use this framework or just not use SVG altogether. However, SVG is a very nice language with many tools. So here, I have a simple inline SVG. It's, it's just SVG in, in HTML. It's not a separate file with a circle element. You understand why I used the uh, view box of 64 very soon. So I can style that circle just like any other element. Let's cancel this horrible black fill and give it a stroke of gold. And SVG has this wonder, wonderful property called stroke dash array. We might get it in, in um, HTML soon, by the way. Um, and this property lets you control how a dashed stroke behaves. Nothing like CSS, where you have to accept whatever dashed border your browser wants to do. So we can control the width of the dash here and the width of the gap. And we can even do weird things like Morse code or even with strokes. So, and it becomes really cool if we increase the stroke width a bit, because then we can do things like starbursts. But we're trying to do a pie chart. Back to the topic, Leah, even though this is really cool. But OK, back to the topic, Leah. So if we increase the. The, the width, the, the length of the gap, quite a lot. How much? As big as the circumference of the circle. So the radius is 25% of 64, which is our coordinates. So if we do 25% multiplied by 64, this gives, us the, this gives us the radius. Multiplied by 2 times pi gives us the circumference, which is about 100. That's why I used 64, because then we get really nice numbers. So. If I specify a gap width that's a length that's as big as the circumference of the circle, then I can adjust this 
and I get something that very closely resembles a pie chart. And I can make it exactly like the, like the pie charts we've been doing so far by styling the main SVG elements as well, which, to which I can apply whatever CSS properties I want because it's also an HTML element. And let's rotate it a bit. It's exactly like the pie charts we've been doing, but much less code and no words, no weird things, no over half classes, no special casing. I can just change one number. And can I animate it? Of course, it's just numbers. I can just make an animation that animates stroke dash array from 0, 100 to 100, 100. And then, wait a second. Let's make it two seconds infinite linear. And then it just animates one line. And I, there's also this property called stroke dash offset to which if I use negative values, I can move the segment around, which is useful if I do multiple segments, which is what I've done here. Uh, you can see how, how dash offset works um, to move the segment so I can, uh, so I can show multiple. Uh, I've, I've just used the, these weird SVG styling attributes here, but you, it could be separate CSS. I just wanted to show all, everything in one place. And by the way, this pie chart, this, the statistics here are very real. Uh, most of the CSS working group is actually companies. Um, so the SVG solution is very flexible, uh, much more maintainable, although you do need extra elements. Oh, but we can write a short script for that, maybe, if it's a big problem. Um, and it's very extensible as well. Uh, the only problem being effects that have to be done by SVG effects. So you can't apply a CSS uh, gradient on the, on the circle, but you can apply an SVG gradient. So overall, SVG is pretty nice. It's a pretty nice solution for this. Can we do better? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we can. So you, you, probably heard, you probably know of CSS linear gradients and radial gradients but you might not have heard of conic gradients. So conic gradients are what you might know from um, Photoshop as angle gradients. They look like this, and you can do really cool things with them. So for example, hmm, let's show you a, a conic gradient that you've definitely seen in many places. You might know already where I'm going with this. Oh, suddenly my computer is very slow. And let's make this round. Oh, come on. So this is the hue wheel you've, you, you've seen in every color picker, that, uh, in any HSL color picker that you've ever used. Um, and we can also do other cool things. Let's cancel this. Like, say, you'll see where this is going. So I will use a repeating conic gradient here. And I will apply a background size to make it smaller. And I can even make a checkerboard. But wait a second. Pie charts, pie charts, back in topic. Back in topic, Leah. Um, sorry, conic gradients are so cool that I keep getting distracted. So let's get back to our basic case. If I move these color stops in the same position, this is a basically equivalent to 40%, and apply a border radius again, here we have it, with two lines of code, basically. Three if you count the, the sizing as well. Can I change it easily? Sure. I can just change this. I can just change the color stop position. Can I add more segments? Sure. I just add another color stop. There. Can I do over 50%? Super easy. And they're defined in the, in the CSS color level four specification, which is currently loading. Um, but this is the URL. Oh, right. There it is. And there are a few examples there. I've also added the ones I've just showed you. Uh, so overall, conic gradients 
pretty awesome. They're the best solution we've seen so far. Very flexible, very maintainable, very extensible. So overall, Conic Gradient is pretty awesome. Except this one little thing, one tiny, tiny thing. They don't have any browser support yet. <laughs> small, small thing. However, this is where you come in. Many developers think that browsers prioritize what to implement based on, I don't know, what they want to implement or based on, I don't know, maybe they consult math.random and they prioritize things. Uh, however, the thing is that the main motivator for browsers to implement something is developer demand. They have entire teams to monitor what developers want. They're called developer relations teams. And yes, it matters what their developers want to implement, and it matters how easy something is. But the first thing is how much developers want it. If, if developers really, really want something, browsers will implement it whether it's, whether, even if none of their developers want to, or if it's super difficult. We've seen examples of this so far, like Flexbox was really difficult to implement. Browsers still did it because developers wanted it. So if you really, if you like Conic Gradients, make noise. Post on the bug reports. Vote on the user voice page that Microsoft has. I'll, uh, I'll show you links soon. But basically, that applies to any feature you want, not just Conic Gradients. Anything you want implemented in browsers, make, make sure you're heard. Because you do have a voice, and browsers do listen. It might take time. It, it takes longer than most people would expect. But it works. Browsers do care. So one thing. I just said that, browser, uh, that, that Conic Gradients have no browser support. So how have I been showing them to you? This is just a browser. How did I show you Conic Gradients? So actually, I've made a Conic Gradient polyfill for this talk that I've released. You can find it here. These examples are live, so you can experiment as well. And there's also a gallery from, uh, with demos that people in the community did. I think some of them are really cool. If you make a cool demo, I can also add it. Um, so many things possible with Conic Gradients. And here, there are also links to the bug reports and the user voice thread to get Conic Gradients implemented. So before I leave you, and I know I've probably gone over a little bit, um, our pie chart's a good idea. I've been showing you for half an hour how to make pie charts with, with CSS and SVG. But are they actually a good idea? How many of you have heard of Edward Tuft, the visualization guru? Oh, OK. He's like really big in, in information visualization. So in his book, he wrote, a table is nearly always better than a dumb pie chart. The only worse design than a pie chart is several of them. For then, the viewer is asked to compare quantities located in spatial disarray, both within and between pies. I'll explain sh shortly what this means if it doesn't make much sense. Given their low data density and failure to order numbers along a visual dimension, pie charts should never be used, he said. Doesn't mean he was right, but he did have a point. Look at this pie chart. Which slice is bigger? Which percentage is bigger? Which percentage is smaller? Can you, can you order them? Well, actually, I'm trolling you here because they're actually all the same. But the thing is, you couldn't be sure, you couldn't be sure because pie charts are not good at this. Look at this one. Which one's smaller? Which one's bigger? Can you rank them? With a bar chart, it becomes much more obvious. However, in some cases, pie charts are an excellent choice. Here, we wanted to show two percentages with very big differences between them, and we wanted multiple of them. Here, bar charts would have been a terrible idea. And also, this, it, this is very weird, but uh, if, you have a, if you have a choice between a bar chart and a pie chart, and, and they both are equally good for your use case, Pick a pie chart because there's actually research that humans like curvy things. <laughs> yes, humans are irrational. We're not a rational animal. But there's actually a study that proves this. In any case, though, even if pie charts are not a good idea for your use case, I hope you've realized by now that this talk was not really about pie charts. Thank you very much. <laughs>